So we move on to part two now, preparing for the build. So this is where we start to get our hands dirty with the actual building of the system. And it says there in this chapter, host tools needed for building LFS are checked and if necessary installed. And this is the important chapter that my videos are about, the host system requirements. And what this is about is saying that you must have each one of these packages installed on your host. So this host is the Endeavor OS. And they must be at least this version. So to a allow you to check these um, versions, they've got a script here which we can copy and paste into the terminal. And it will give us some output which we can inspect oh that's interesting I've never seen that before was not check I'm not quite sure what happened there um, let's try that again copyright yeah I'm just going to run I'm not sure if the printouts just come up a bit funny there let's run the bash version again that's better. It must have been some delayed text that suddenly appeared on the terminal as the script was running. So you can see that each line is uh, a bit of output relating to the packages. So all we need to do is just go through each one of these and double check that the version that we've got on the screen on the right is at least the same as or greater than the version in the book. So you can see the first one, bash 3.2 is the minimum version and we've got 5.1 so that's that's fine and it also says that bin sh should be a symbolic or hard link to bash and you can see we've actually got that bin sh points to user bin bash so all we do is just quickly go down these just check the versions you can see bin utils that's uh, much higher than what's required 2.35 it needs 2.25 bison's 2.7 we've got 3.7 and it also says user bin yak should be linked to bison or similar uh, small script that executes bison. And you can see yak is bison 3.72, so that's fine. bzip2 should be 104, we've got 108. Core utils should be 6.9, we've got 8.32. Diff utils should be 2.8.1, we've got 3.7. Find utils should be 4.2.31, we've got 4.7, so that's fine. Gork should be 4.0.1, we've got 5.1.0 and it also says that the user bin orc should be linked to Gork and you can see user bin orc is pointed to user bin Gork, so that's fine. Next GCC should be 6.2, we've got 10.2, so that's fine. And it says including the C++ compiler as well, so we've got that as well. And it says versions greater than 10.2.0 are not recommended as they have not been tested. Well, luckily we've got one that's just at 10.2.0. I believe they put these versions in because these are the versions that are going to be built in the Linux from scratch system. So obviously if there's nothing newer to test against at the time of publication of the book, then they can't guarantee that a newer version other than the one that's going to be installed in Linux from scratch will actually work with the Linux from scratch instructions so that's what that's about glibc 2.11 GNU libc 2.32 so that's fine again versions greater than 2.33 are not recommended so we're all right there grep 2.5.1a we've got 3.6 gzip 1.3.12 we've got 1.10 so that's fine linux kernel's got to be 3.2 or greater so we've got 5.10.11, that's fine. M4, we've got 1.4.18, which is better than 1.4.10, so that's fine. Make, we need 4.0, we've got 4.3. Patch, 2.5.4, and we've got 2.7.6. Perl, 5.8.8, we've got 5.3.2.0. Python 3.4, we've got 3.9.1, that's great. Sed 4.1.5, we've got 4.8. Tar 1.22, we've got 1.33. Uh, 
text info we've got 4.7 and installed we've got 6.7 and lastly xz 5.0.0 is required and we've got 5.2.5 .5. and then the last line just proves that the C++ compiler is working and it mentions there that symlinks that are required so it's important that the symlinks that are reported here do actually appear as expected in that list so as you can see the Endeavor OS as it's booted is just ready to go and carry on we don't have to worry about fetching other packages or trying to work out what package names um, are required and so on so again just to recap on what the stages are for building um, the first bit is to uh, these are accomplished on the host system and what does it say about when restarting be careful of following Oh yes, I think this is about um, preparing the system. This is what we're going to be doing immediately next. Um, and then it's a bit about mounting the partition and creating an LFS user. And then we'll enter uh, and creating the temporary system. And then we'll mount the, uh, we'll enter the troop environment and actually build the system. And we'll do that as root. So the preparation is done as root. We build the temporary system as a LFS user that's created, and then we build the actual final system as the root user. So it's important because we're going to be doing stuff as the root user to make sure that the certain things are done correctly in case we trash the system we're running on. So although maybe that's not such an important issue as I've booted from a live image. Um, if you're running an actual, say for example, you're running your own Linux system already and you're using that as the host system, um, it's important to make sure certain commands which I'll point out, they're pointed out in the book, are run correctly um, to prevent trashing your host system. So the first thing is all about creating a partition to put Linux on. They've got a recommendation of 30 gigabyte. Yeah, it does say here a minimal system of around 10 gigabytes. That would be an absolute minimum. You wouldn't be able to get much else done or much else installed with 10 gigabytes um, without starting to pare back um, some parts of the installation. For example, the source files you could get rid of. Although it's handy to leave them around in case you need to rebuild anything. Um, yeah, 30 gig would be good. I'd suggest if you want to go for... BLFS and install lots from that that maybe 50 or 60 gigabytes would be a better better, better figure um, as mentions other partition issues here goes into all the ins and outs of it um, if you're booting with or going to use a GPT partition table that you'll need a um, a boot partition um, one thing, the book by default um, still assumes that you're create, creating a um, MBT partition, MBR partition, sorry, and it doesn't make any assumptions that you'd be booting with UEFI. So I will be sticking with that. I'll just be booting with a, a standard um, MBR partition and I'll be booting in the traditional way, a BIOS boot, so I won't be creating a, a boot partition at all for the GPT, the GPT boot partition. Um, if you want to know how to boot with UEFI and use your GPT partition, again, go to my channel. Um, one of the videos that I've, a set of videos for installing Linux from scratch up there has got an installation for uh, UEFI installation and what you need to do to um, you know what changes you need to make to the LFS installation to do that. Uh, as I say, I won't be doing that because it's not part of the standard Linux from scratch build. I'll just follow the standard Linux from scratch to make it easy for anybody who's never done this before. Just makes it less complicated. Also, there's um, a system D version of the book. Um, again, I won't be following that version. I'll just be following the SysV init version but there is an actual book for that, so that's uh, standard. So if you're interested in booting with a system D, then 
obviously that book's slightly different, but it's it's more or less the same. It's just the packages you have to install. Uh, there's a few extra packages. So uh, I've often wondered why there's never really much information about create a uh, partition of the disk in this previous chapter. If I just go back, it kind of just tells you some general information, but doing these Linux from scratch videos, I realize now that everybody's situation is different. You know, what, what size disks you've got, how you might want to have your partitions laid out. You might want to sit this next to a existing installation, maybe Windows or another Linux system. And I think that's why it's never really any specific instructions on, on the layout for that um, partition. Um, and I think that kind of gets some people who are maybe not really into creating partitions. So I'll go through that myself, how I'm going to do that on this system. As I say, this will just be a BIOS boot. So um, if you've got a modern machine with UEFI boot, you'll need to turn that off, turn off the security, and you may have to turn off the UEFI part as well so that it boots to the BIOS. There might be a compatibility mode in there. I think it's called CST, something like that, that you'll have to change in the BIOS so that it, it will allow the machine to boot from a normal MBR partition without uh, any UEFI code, any UEFI firmware to boot from. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this easy. Normally I create three partitions on a standalone Linux from scratch system. There'll be a boot partition which will hold the kernel to boot from, the main root file system partition and a swap partition. Uh, I won't create the separate boot partition because it just makes things a little bit more complicated for um, the boot up. So if you've never done this before it just adds a little bit more complexity. If you understand these sort of things, and I'd, I would recommend creating a separate boot partition, it's um, a little bit more secure in case something goes wrong with the main file system, and you have the your file system set up so that the boot doesn't automatically get mounted at boot up. It just makes it a little bit safer. But for um, first time, if you've never done this before, or if, you know you're still quite new to this, uh, if you just follow what I do, that that will make it a lot simpler for you to understand and, and pick up on. So what we do here is at the moment you can see we're what they call a live user and we need to become the root. So the easiest way to do that is to type in the command sudo space su minus and you can see immediately we've become the root user. So now we've got all the power of the system, we can do whatever we like to the system, therefore we've got to be careful what we do because we've um, that uh, power, we can do a lot of damage to the system if we're not careful with the commands we type in. So if we type in fdisk space minus l, what this does, it lists all the um, devices, the storage devices on the system. And what you can see here is we've got three devices. The first one, dev sda, which is the actual hard disk in this um, machine which is actually a uh, an SSD. Then I've got another device. This is the USB that I've booted from. And finally we've got this loop device and this is the image that's on that USB that's allowed this operating system to boot. So the two we do not want to touch are these two. We do not want to touch DevSDB and we do not want to touch this loop device. This is the one we want to be dealing with, DevSDA. And as I did there, if you double click text in this window, it will auto select portions of it depending on certain rules. And you can see if I double click SDA, it highlights it all. Unfortunately, it includes the colon. Some terminals configured not to include punctuation such as the colon. So what, why I'm showing you this is because when we do stuff with this disk, with this block device, it's safer to double click that designation so we don't type in any errors. Um, you know, if you typed in dev SDA and somehow mistyped and typed dev SDB and we didn't check what we typed in, we could do damage to the uh, USB live image and you know, then that would just trash the machine or 
trash the image and um, things would lock up and wouldn't work so uh, by double clicking we copy that into the uh, clipboard automatically and we can just paste it in when we need it so um, at the moment as you can see this um, USB device has got two partitions on it and if you compare that to the dev SDA it's blank it's got no information apart from the, the layout the physical layout of the disk so what we need to do to edit that is to type in fdisk again space and then just center click your mouse button and it'll paste what's highlighted just remember to remove that colon at the end and then press enter and you can see now it says that it's going to well it's created a new DOS disk label this is the MBR type this is what we want the basic disk layout and what I want to do now is to create create a swap partition no in fact I'll create the root um, partition first of all um, now actually I will create the swap because if you're on a rotating disk it's better to have the swap partition at the beginning because if you do need to use the swap partition the data will be read in and out of the swap file faster than it would be if the sorry the swap partition not the swap file it'll be read faster if the partition was at the beginning of the disk than if it was at the end of the disk just because of the way the physical layout of the sectors are on the disk so I'll create a new uh, partition type in N create a primary type partition so I'll just accept the default again accept the first partition the default press enter and accept the first sector 2048 now the last sector I don't know what the last sector is going to be but I do know that I want the swap partition to be um, say one gigabyte in size this machine's got eight gigabytes on it um, you probably don't need a, a great deal of swap space it's just there for safety in case you do start running out of memory you'll see the machine slowing down so it's a good indication that swaps being used having said that this is an SSD drive it will slow down slightly but not as much as if it was a rotating drive um, but uh, do you really want your SSD drive to be thrashed about with stuff swapping to it you know unnecessary right so uh, it's something to bear in mind how big you make it and even whether you do have a swap um, partition for for your system with an SSD but Eight gigabytes is uh, more than enough to build Linux from scratch in. I think four gig is plenty as well. You wouldn't really touch a swap device. Having said that, the kernel does like to use a little bit of it. So even if it doesn't really need it, you'll find after a while it might have used um, you know a few megabytes of swap space. So stick it in there and. Uh, just let the kernel decide what it wants to use so like I say I'm going to create a one gigabyte swap partition so I type in 1G for one gigabyte it works I'm oh, sorry you've got to put plus 1G it works out what the sector should be and it's created it and there it says create a partition one of type Linux and of size one gigabyte now I don't want it to be of a type Linux I want it to be a swap type so to change that I do T for type I didn't know what the partition number was, what the code was, I do L as it suggests there. And the number that I want is 82. You can see here it says Linux swap, and that actually says stroke Solaris after that. So I want to type in 82 here and press enter. And you can see it says it's changed the type of partition Linux to Linux swap stroke Solaris. And if I do P now to print the partition table, you can see there's the first partition dev sta1 with the start um, sector which was the default we accepted and it has calculated that for a one gig partition what we requested that the number of sectors is that many and so therefore that's the end sector so we didn't need to worry about the technicalities of where the sectors are and so on so now we need to create a partition for the root file system so again we do n for new accept the default again P for primary and again accept the default the next available partitions too once again accept the default first sector so that's the next three sector after the last one that was used um, 
for the swap you can see that's 2099199 .99. it's picked up 2099200 now we just want to use the rest of the disk so again just press enter and you can see it's created a disk sorry a partition that's just obviously a little bit smaller than the disk of roughly 250 gigabytes approximately so if we now do P to print the partition table up you can see our layout the first partition SDA1 is the swap and our second is the what is going to be the root file system so all we need to do now is to press W and enter to write that to the disk and it quits the program so it writes the that information to the disk and it's quit so now if I do FDIS-L you'll see the def SDA has got those two partitions that were just created so now we can return to the book and it gives um, an example of how to format the root file system and you can see where it's got this XXX that's the um, number or the designation of the partition that we want to format to this ext4 format so that we can actually write some information to to a file system on that disk. So at the moment, all this disk has got is a layout of a partition that's empty for the swap, and another partition that's empty. It's got nothing on it. It's totally blank for the root file system. What we need to do now is format the file system, the root file system, to put a file system on there, and the file system type is the ext4. So I'll copy this command in here so I'll just highlight it I center click in this terminal and it pastes it immediately and all I've got to do is rub out this bit here in fact I could rub out all that lot and just like I did before double click this bit center click again to paste it in and that's formatted it straight away obviously if you're on a rotating disk a mechanical disk that will take a little bit longer um, it won't be as quick as that. Then we've got a command to create the swap partition. So the swap partition needs to be formatted. In fact, it's just a little signature, I think, that gets written to it. So again, we highlight that, center paste. Just rub out the dev designation. Oh, oh dear, I've done the wrong partition. No, I haven't. It's gone off the screen. That's all oh, that worried me a little bit there. Yeah, double click it. SDA is one. Sorry, SDA one we want for the swap. Center click that, and you can see it's uh, looks like it's wiped an old ext4 signature there. Have I done? I did do something wrong there, didn't I? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Right. Let's go recap on that. The MKFS should have been on SDA2. So that's the root file system. I did get this wrong around. I felt like I'd done something wrong there. So that, yeah, the MKFS, this first one should be on the larger of the two partitions, this one here. So because I've formatted that wrong, I need to redo it. That's, that's right, that's better. It's taken a little bit longer now because it's a lot bigger. Okay, so that was the command for creating the root file system. I'll rerun the MK swap, which is on the first partition, and it, you can see there it now says wiping old, old swap signature. So let me just recap that to make sure there's no mistake. So on the first partition, SDA1, that's the swap. This is the command that I ran or should have run and I did run and for the second one it's the root file system this is the command I run for the root uh, file system so that should be dev sda2 in this situation um, yeah sorry about that mistake you can see how easy it is to make mistakes and luckily it's not a a terminal mistake so if we move on now now we've, now we've created a partition on disk we've formatted the partition so we're, they're ready to be used and this bit here is telling us about this LFS variable and it's used throughout the books several times and the reason they run this command here is to create this environment variable so that we can refer to LFS and we don't really care what LFS is pointing at it could be pointing at 
um, forward slash ABCD forward slash MNT forward slash LFS or something else. Um, but it just makes it consistent. So we can always refer to LFS and not really have to worry about where it's pointing at. But the thing is that it's important to make sure that whenever we refer to LFS that it is already defined. If it's not defined and we're root, we're, we're going to cause problems with the host system and that will just render the rest of the build invalid. It, it will just stop us from doing anything else. So like it says here, whenever you're unsure if the LFS variable is set, if you type in this command echo dollar LFS, it should return this or whatever you set the LFS variable to. And as it says here, one way to ensure that the LFS variable is always set is to add it to your bash profile in, in the root um, bash profile. Because I'm using a live image here, it's a bit pointless because once the live image has been shut down, everything just gets forgotten. <clears throat> but if you're using um, a Linux system that's on a disk um, to build Linux from scratch, then that might be an idea to do that. So next we move on to mounting the new partition. So this is the partition that we've just created. So what we do first with this command here is to make um, this directory LFS so at the moment. If I do S MNT. You can see there's just a directory there called MNT, and if I show you what's inside it, there's nothing inside it. This command here will create the LFS directory inside MNT because the LFS variable points to all of that. And as you can see, it says it's created the directory called MNT LFS. So if I now do LS minus L MNT, there's the directory. And this is the directory where we're going to mount the Linux from scratch partition. <clears throat> um, and if you're using multiple partitions, there's some separate commands here, but we're not doing that. I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. So we'll just stick with this instruction up here. Just copy and paste that in. We modify this dev for our um, file system partition, which is the second one, SDA2, paste that in, and as you can see, it says it's been mounted. Okay, so, yeah, it, as it says here, it assumes you'll not be restarting the computer throughout the LFS process, um, and if you do plan on doing that and you're not using a live image system because all this will be lost, then you can add this information to the FS tab, but I'm going to assume that this is all going to be done in one sitting. Um, on a modern machine, it shouldn't take um, perhaps more than a day to do this. The other thing we've got to do is to turn on the swap partition. So we'll just rub this designation out here and put in the designation for the swap partition, which is this one here, SDA1, and you can see that it's um, added it in there and we can use, well there's two ways of doing this, you can either do cat proc swaps and that will show you what swaps are active or an easier way is to use the swap on command by itself and it shows you that dev sda partition type 1 gigabyte is mounted as a swap partition and there's nothing being used at the moment. <coughs> 